before that. <laughs> um, back in uh, fall of 2020 was our original plan. So I'm, I'm really glad that we can do this. SDO has a, a long history of observing the entire sun at all times. And one of the unique uh, data series that we've come up with is this vector magnetic field, where we measure the vector magnetic field over the surface of the sun continuously every, every 90 seconds now and every 135 seconds since the beginning of the mission, typically translated into 12 minute uh, time series so that people can understand what's happening in a, in a way that we haven't been able to see before. So what we wanted to do in this session was give you some insight into some of the people who have, um, or some of the results that have been um, learned, some of the things that have been learned over the last uh, 10 years. There's now a solar cycle of data. And I think there's a, a lot to look forward to as well when we think about DKIST coming online with high resolution um, and yet continuing with the, uh, the full disk context measurements from SDO and other instruments as well. So I'm looking forward to this. Our first speaker is Shidong Sun. He was a graduate student at Stanford at the time, I think, when um, SDO was launched. Um, so he's been involved with this from, from at least the time of launch and a little bit before. And uh, he's going to give uh, an overview of the, some of the results and the prospects for the future. So Shudong, I'll give you a warning after 22 minutes. I'd like you to wrap up after 25, and that'll give us five minutes for questions. So take it away. All right, thank you, Todd. Let me share my screen. Can you see the slides? Yes. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, um, thank you for the invitation, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so I just want to mention that uh, 11 years ago, yesterday actually, March 24th, uh, was the first light of uh, the uh, HMI instrument. As you can see here, it is uh, part of the HMI team while waiting for the door to be open so HMI could measure uh, the magnetic field. So the uh, topic I was given is vector magnetic field progress and prospects. Um, it is a pretty broad topic. So uh, what I'm going to do here is to break it down into three uh, small parts. And uh, in the first part, I would like to introduce the HMI instruments, especially the vector magnetic field pipeline and some of the highlights and uh, uh, perhaps a little bit of caveats of the magnetic field uh, measurements in general. And uh, then I will talk about some of the unique science that has been enabled uh, by the HMI vector magnetic field measurements. Um, and I think uh, Brian and uh, Manolis would also touch on that. So I will just focus on one particular topic that is the modeling of the active region coronal magnetic field but using HMI as input. Uh, and last is the, um, the prospects part. And I will talk about several upcoming new facilities and missions that will measure the vector magnetic field in the photosphere and how we should and we can improve the magnetic field inference. Um, we first started to ve uh, measure the vector magnetic field uh, in the 60s. So uh, this is uh, coming from the uh, Crimean Observatory. And on the right-hand side, if you can see my cursor, is an image of the sunspot. Uh, the contours are the line of sight magnetic field and these arrows are the streamlines inferred from the transverse magnetic field measurements. So immediately you can tell the importance of vector magnetic field, which can help you understand the, uh, for example, electric currents and uh, non-potential structure in the active region that line of sight uh, data alone cannot give you. Now, from the 80s to the 2000s, uh, many different countries have developed their own instrumentation. And uh, here in the US, uh, we have a few facilities measuring the vector magnetic field. And uh, here is an example from the uh, Sunspot, uh, uh, you know, the uh, observatories uh, um, are, are led by a National Solar Observatory. And here are three snapshots of a forming active region. You can see the intensity, magnetic field strength, inclination, and azimuth. Uh, back then, the resolution has already achieved uh, a few arc seconds. Uh, in 2000s, uh, we have a lot more new instruments. We have SOLAS and then the first space-based magnetographic Hinode. Uh, this is an image of a sunspot taken by Hinode. And you can see compared with uh, uh, 50 years ago in 2000, uh, 1960s, the resolution really improves a lot by a factor of 10 or more. Uh, and since then, we have had the balloon-born uh, instrument uh, Sunrise and IMAX. 
And then in 2010, uh, SDO-HMI is the first space-based full disk vector magnetograph. And in the 2010s and 2020s, we have a few new instruments, and especially with the upcoming solar orbiter, uh, the fine instrument and uh, several instruments on DKIST, uh, we're going to get uh, um, observations that is very complementary to what we are having now. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, mention that we don't actually measure the vector magnetic field directly, uh, but rather what we measure are the polarization states in spectral lines uh, across the line at different wavelengths. And from there, uh, we model the solar atmosphere, including the magnetic field to fit the spectral lines and to infer the vector magnetic fields. Uh, this page shows you a diagram out of uh, how HMI um, actually process their data from the first step filtergrams all the way to the uh, vector magnetic field patches sharps. So HMI is a, 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 the a filtergraph type instrument. It measures the, uh, the absorption line of RN1 at 6173. It measures uh, six different polarization states, I plus minus Q, I plus minus U, I plus minus V at six wavelengths across the line. So from these filter uh, graphs, we perform uh, calibration to bring it to level one. And then we perform uh, some gap filling, uh, cosmic ray removal, derotation, and temporal um, interpolation to align all the images to a target type. And from there, we create a set of 24 images this time. That's six wavelengths times the four polarization states, IQ, UV, the Stokes parameters. This is the so-called Stokes uh, data we have. Now we pass the Stokes data through the uh, VFSV, the inversion uh, um, module, uh, where we um, use a Milne-Eddington um, uh, approximation to infer the magnetic field and uh, several other parameters. Uh, and from this uh, um, milne eddington inversion results, the azimuth of the field vector, uh, you already know that uh, uh, it has a 180 degree ambiguity. So we pass this through again through a second uh, disambiguation uh, module that resolve this ambiguity. Now this brings us to the full vector uh, on the full disk. So this is the uh, nominal full disk vector magnetogram data set. And eventually, uh, we extract the active region patches and group them. And this is the space weather uh, active region patches or sharp. Uh, I think HMI's strength really lies in the four, uh, these four aspects. First, it has a very high or even uh, flexible cadence, and Todd already told you about. So we have the nominal uh, 720 second uh, cadence, but we also have this high cadence data at 90 or 135 seconds. And recently we also produced these uh, long time averagings, 96 minute averaging that uh, can significantly reduce the um, noise. The second aspect is the load latency. So most of the data uh, after uh, downlink will be available within about one hour as at the near real time data product. And after several days after careful calibration they become defin definitive. And the third is their consistent quality uh, without seeing in space. And then uh, we have the complete coverage both in time and in space. Uh, at this point, over 11 years, we have approximately 500,000 full disk images. On the right, I'm showing you a, uh, the, a movie of a five days evolution of a famous active region in 2011. So this is the data set we can get eventually after extracting the uh, vector magnetograms. And you can see there's a extraordinary amount of you know, details in these data sets that we can use. Um, for the sharp uh, data set I just showed you, uh, there are two different versions. The one I just showed you is remapped into a cylindrical equal area coordinate. So everything is the same size and uh, you can use them directly in your Cartesian coordinate model. We also have a direct cutout data series. So at this point, we have about uh, 4,200 unique regions and about uh, 2.7 mil uh, million uh, records. And for each record, we calculate uh, above uh, uh, over 20 different space weather parameters, including the uh, unsigned magnetic flux or current helicity and so on and so forth. And these can be used for space weather prediction. 
Now, after Sharp, uh, there are a few higher level data products as well. Um, on the right-hand side, I'm showing you an example uh, of the um, velocity field in the second row and electric field in the third row derived from the uh, CGEM um, project using the PDFI method. Okay, so these uh, high level products are available as well through the regular um, portals from the JSOC website, uh, SolarSoft IDL, or uh, SunPy modules. All right, now we know that uh, uh, the vector magnetic pipeline is quite complex and there are places where things can go wrong, uh, where we cannot infer the magnetic field reliably. So I just want to mention these briefly as well. So on the right-hand side, I'm showing you an example where the uh, inversion fell in Side a large sunspot. Okay, so this is one of the largest sunspots in solar cycle 24. And uh, the second image here I'm showing you is the uh, inferred magnetic field strength. And inside the very dark parts of the umbra, you can see a patch that has uh, some kind of a weaker uh, magnetic field compared to uh, its surroundings. It seems uh, very weird. So, what happens is that if you look at the actual spectra HMI is observing, uh, the line becomes very broad due to the strong magnetic field strength and the intensity is also very low. So really the spectra is pushing the um, dynamic range of the instrument. And the uh, inversion code basically cannot find a good fit of such a, a broad line. Uh, thus the inferred magnetic field is uh, not reliable. The message I wanna convey really is the following. Uh, HMI also uh, provides many um, you know, un uncertainty information, including the uncertainty on individual variables in the first and their uh, correlation, cross correlations between them. So here, the third image is uh, uh, the um, uh, portional uncertainty um, of the magnetic field. And you can see inside the umbra where the measurement is bad, you have over 10% uh, up to 20% uncertainty. So when you are analyzing the data, it would be very helpful to take a look at the uncertainty information as well. Uh, that still has some other uh, issues that uh, I think the user should be aware. Uh, one of them is uh, shown in this diagra diagram on the left. On the top is the uh, strong magnetic field pixel inside one sharp region as it rotates across the disk. So the x-axis is time. So the, uh, so the top is the uh, strong field pixels and the bottom is the total unsigned flux. And you can see these uh, small wiggles on top, of, on, uh, on top of this curve. And this is caused by the leakage of the SDO's orbital velocity into the magnetic field, inf inferred magnetic field. And it has a period of about 12 hours and also 24 hours. And this happens because we don't have enough knowledge of the spectral profiles of the instrument. So this will cause a few percent of the um, oscillations on top of the, your magnetic field signals. There are other more subtle uh, effects. Uh, for example, the noise level in the line of sight and the transverse field are different. This is intrinsic to the vector magnetic field measurements and not to HMI alone. Now, if you are calculating, calculating the unsigned flux, you need to combine the line of sight and transverse component into your radio field map and depends on where you are on the disk, you will have different levels of noise in your radio field map. And that could partially explain these two bumps uh, at about 60 to 50 uh, longitude of the active region. Um, a more recently um, discovered uh, artifact uh, has something to do with the limit resolution of the instruments that could cause the sign changes of the uh, transverse, uh, actually horizontal component of the vector magnetic field. Uh, I'm not going into details, but I suggest you can take a look at this uh, PEPTOF 2021 paper. All right, uh, now let me move on to the second part of the uh, science enabled by HMI. Uh, so um, as of yesterday, when I checked on ADS, this vector magnetic field uh, paper has uh, uh, already had uh, about 300 uh, uh, citations. And I produced this word cloud uh, using the new ADS um, function. And you can immediately see some buzzword here. For example, the evolution, uh, the energy and flare and active region. So um, because of HMI has this uh, full coverage, right? And in temporal and in time. So one aspect it really excels at is to enable the study of active region uh, non-potential 
non-potentiality in a statistical and time-dependent manner. So let me show you uh, three different examples. The first example is that now we can really model the corona in a time-dependent way. Uh, the time sequence of vector magnetograms have really enabled uh, this uh, series of efforts to develop this uh, uh, new data-driven uh, coronal magnetic field models. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing you a, a magneto friction model. Uh, that's the effort from coming from the CGM team. And on the top, these are the two maps of the output at uh, low corona, the corona base and the mid corona. And uh, uh, in the bottom row, I'm showing you the uh, vertical cut of the, this magnetic field. You can see as the time evolves, uh, this magnetic field uh, evolves slowly and there are incidents where you can see the magnetic field lifts off just like an eruption. And there are uh, several teams that are working on this uh, uh, efforts right now. Now, besides the, these new methods, you can also uh, use the uh, older methods, for example, the nonlinear force free field uh, extrapolation, and now just do a time sequence of them to study the evolution of the active region. For example, uh, you can see, uh, you can study the energy evolution uh, from its emergence to uh, flaring, or you can study the helicity, the twist of the magnetic flux rope, or even uh, more complex uh, topology evolution as well. A second topic is uh, really something that interests me a lot. Uh, with these detailed magnetic field maps and sophisticated coronal models, you can really model the coronal magnetic field topology uh, you know, uh, realistically and recover some of the uh, most complex coronal topology and more relevant to uh, solar flares. So here I'm listing two specific topics. Uh, the first one is the so-called bald patch, where the magnetic field is uh, tangent at the uh, neutral line on the uh, photosphere. So this indicates that the coronal loops form a U-shape and grace the photosphere. Now on the right, I'm showing you a uh, data-constrained MHD modeling uh, for the famous 2017 flare. Uh, and uh, this first row shows you the currents on the vertical slides through the domain. And uh, the bottom row shows you the twist of the flux rope. And immediately you can see in the beginning, uh, the flux rope actually graces the photosphere. That's because there is a bot patch right here uh, on the bottom. And now as the flare, uh, as the eruption uh, onsets, now you can see that this uh, bot patch gradually uh, gets lifted off and then turns into this so-called uh, hyperbolic flux tube with a sort of an X point um, structure here. So basically the bald patch is completely destructed uh, during this eruption and turns into a regular uh, arcade, flare arcade. And then you can also see the flare uh, current sheet right here. Now the series of HMI uh, magnetograms allows you to do this kind of uh, modeling. A second topic is the so-called uh, spine fan topology. And that happens where you have this uh, smaller uh, bipole emerged into this larger bipole, okay? What you get is this dome-shaped magnetic uh, topology with a single spine field line coming out from the fan dome and, and connects far away. And this topology uh, ha is able to explain some of the most exotic uh, uh, flare emission features such as the circular ribbons and even the extreme ultraviolet late phase uh, discovered by the EVE instrument. Uh, a third uh, example is that with the uh, complete coverage of the HMI instrument, now you can really perform a large amount of models of the uh, coronal magnetic field and to say something about the statistics uh, and touch on the eruption mechanism of the solar eruptions. Uh, so on the right hand side, I'm showing you one a recent paper uh, on this uh, topic. So the authors actually studied about uh, two dozen uh, er uh, large eruptions. And on the left is one example of the pre-flare eruption. Uh, and as you can see here, the um, sign surface is the uh, twist equal to one uh, isosurface in the corona field model that the authors used to define the flex rope, okay? And on the right-hand side is uh, about one hour after the eruption. And you can see uh, the flex rope structure is mostly gone, okay? Now you can use this model to study the total twist in the flux rope uh, as an indicator of the uh, possibility of the kink instability, or you can study the decay index of the background potential field at the apex of this flux rope. 
to uh, study whether torus instability is a possibility. So the authors uh, developed this kind of diagram. Okay, so the x axis is the twist number and the y axis is the decay index. So the red symbols are uh, pre eruption uh, numbers. So you can see the decay index is large and the twist is large. So both torus and kink instability could happen. Now, the interesting thing here is that after the flare, uh, these are the flus, uh, blue symbols, both the twist and the decay index increases. And this is, seems to be a very general trend. Okay. Uh, so this really indicates that they expel of helicity from the low corona. And you can get that from the, the static model alone. And this also uh, indicates that the uh, lower boundary surface magnetogram also changes during the flare. And I think that's something on Brian will touch on later. So it is these kind of uh, statistical study you can now do uh, with the help of HMI data. All right, let me come to the last part. Um, so in the next few years, a few uh, new instrument will come online uh, that also measures the vector magnetic field in the solar photosphere. On the right, I'm showing you the first uh, light image of the quiet sun uh, from the deepest uh, instrument uh, facility. Okay, so you can see this extraordinary amount of details in high, in high resolution. So these are the four things I think would be helpful from the uh, new instruments. Uh, for example, uh, the large aperture leads to high resolution and high cadence. And this is especially relevant for DKIS and uh, the European Solar Telescope upcoming. And DKIS has another uh, power is that is it has diagnostic power in multiple spectral line at the same time. And that could allow you to probe really the height information uh, in the solar atmosphere. Now, that being said, uh, because the uh, aperture is so large, usually the um, field of view is quite small. Here I'm plotting the instantaneous field of view of, view of a uh, IFU type instrument, the NERSP of DKIS, that really just cover a few arc seconds. Even if you can do this uh, mosaic uh, rapidly, you will only be able to cover up to a, a couple um, arc minutes uh, field of view. So we really still need HMI type instrument to provide the contacts and the large scale magnetic connectivity. And at this point, I'm not aware uh, of any uh, US um, based uh, you know, follow up uh, missions on the synoptic and full disk spectrum uh, coverage. But I think that will be important as well. Now there's also the solar orbiter uh, mission where we have this uh, fine instrument and that could measure the vector magnetic field and that will provide the new vantage points. Uh, so some, just a few uh, details about uh, DKIST. So DKIST has a four meter aperture of access telescope and the resolution uh, could be as high as 0.03 arc seconds or about 25 kilometers in the optical uh, wavelength. And that's another 10 times boost from Hinode. Uh, it also has the capability of measure multiple, um, you know, spectral lines uh, polarimetry at the same time with a very high accuracy. Um, a special capability of DKIS is really that it starts to measure the coronal spectral polarimetry regularly so we can infer the coronal magnetic field directly. Uh, one of the ins instruments, the diffraction limited near infrared uh, spectral polarimeter allows us to measure the uh, optical and infrared spectra at very high resolution. Uh, it also has a very high, um, uh, um, I mean, it also has three different spectral arms covering these wavelengths. So you can measure these uh, three, up to three different spectral ranges at the same time. Now, what can this do for, for science? So first of all, for the high resolution, uh, what you can really uh, improve is this fine scale structure of magnetic field. For example, here are the contrast of two maps of uh, vertical current densities you infer from high resolution and smeared low resolution magnetogram. And you can see all these uh, small scale, fine scale structures are lost actually uh, once you go to the lower resolution. So this could actually provide a lot more energy into the corona that drives the eruption and heating. So high resolution could really give you this. Now the lower panel shows you an example of what multi-line uh, spectral polarimetry can do. So this is an example measure, uh, that's measuring the helium uh, 1083 line, uh, as well as a nearby silicon line, which is a photospheric line. 
So with these two vector magnetograms inferred from these two lines, what you can really do is to look at the um, change of the vector field orientation at different heights. In this particular case, uh, in the low uh, layers in the photosphere, you have a bald patch structure. As you move on to higher layers, it disappears. And that is a very strong evidence that there is a very low lying magnetic flux rope in the uh, corona. So uh, the observations from DKIS could also give you this. Two minutes left, Shudong. All right, I'm almost done. Um, so with a, a solar orbiter, a fine instrument, uh, it has two telescopes that's also measure the same uh, 6173 lines as HMI and has a full disk telescope and a high resolution telescope that this uh, image is partial disk. So the sampling is about 0.5 arc second per pixel. The neat thing here is that because at the close perihelion, uh, phi uh, is at about 0.28 uh, AU, you, you will get much higher resolution, okay? And uh, when combined with HMI as illustrated in this diagram, you have uh, two different uh, line of sight uh, that could measure the vector magnetic field at the same time. And that will allow you to resolve the 180 degree azimuth ambiguity immediately. Okay, so the last uh, thing I wanna to touch on is that um, with these uh, upcoming uh, great instruments, uh, something the sci uh, we scientists can do is to improve the magnetic field inference using new uh, techniques. For example, we can uh, you know, get a better uncertainty characterization of the inferred magnetic field. And that includes both the statistical and uh, systematic biases. And another thing we can do is to perhaps to um, put in more constraint in our inversion techniques. And here on the right, I'm showing you a recent example of uh, replacing the hydrostatic constraint in the inversion. That is the, this uh, gradient of P equals to the vertical gradient of the row uh, equation of state with a magneto hydrostatic constraint that includes the Lorentz force as well. So now after you include this uh, new constraint, you can actually uh, infer the magnetic field in a geometric height rather than the optical depth. And when the authors apply that to a sunspot observations, uh, they um, you know, naturally recover this Wilson depression uh, structure. And I think that's a really neat experiment. Uh, last, I think Rebecca is also going to touch on this, uh, is the machine learning algorithm that can also be used for a magnetic field inference. This is really driven by the fact that we'll get a large volume of data with DKIS and new instrumentations. For DKIS, we're going to get about 20 terabytes of data per day. And that is way too much for the traditional inversion to invert. Um, there are several diff different approaches. So one of the pioneering work here from uh, Asuncio Ramos and Diaz Paso is uh, they train the um, a neural network on uh, MHD um, models. And after validation, validating the result on the uh, MHD observer, observables, and they applied that to observations to get really reasonable results. And you can also leverage the database, for example, the Hinode and HMI archive and train on the observations and apply them to uh, observations later. There are also these uh, physical um, constraints, for example, uh, divergence freeness, and you can also explore the temporal dimension using the uh, uh, machine learning technique. All right, here's my uh, summary. And uh, what I was really trying to convey is that HMI is a great instrument and it has enabled really some unique and important investigations, primarily in the uh, active region. And I think the upcoming facilities will provide a really complementary uh, diagnostics to HMI. And at the same time, a uh, new analysis tool will be crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Shudong. Very nice talk. Appreciate it. You did a nice job of uh, summarizing both the past and looking for ahead toward the future. I have a couple questions from the chat. Uh, one refers to, I think, the plot that you were showing just before the DKIST image about modeling X points. And there was a question from Samaya Sabri about whether there, how many X points there were in that particular uh, active region. So maybe you could just say something about that if, you, if that's enough information to get you there. You're muted if you, um, I can't hear you.
Ty, Ty, you have to unmute the person yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, all right. Yeah, uh, in that particular active region, uh, several studies found the uh, one X point in further north, but that's not the really the X point that's in the plot. In that plot, it's actually uh, X uh, 3D X line uh, in 3D. It's a it's a crossing between the um, quasi separatrix surface below the uh, flex uh, rope. So it's more of a X line type of structure. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Janet Lumen. Um, she says, thank you for the nice talk. How important are the missing details on the large scale, on the global scale that is, um, missing details in the magnetic conductivity for evaluating the eruptivity? Is the local active region focus really enough? And is there a way to include it in a straightforward way? I think this gets to um, you know, the context for DKIST and mm -hmm. what else do you need? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great question. Um, so definitely, um, and I did not mention that there's really um, great progress in the global uh, models as well. Um, but the thing um, is that uh, the vector magnetic field, uh, that's a limitation of the Zeeman effect. You, you know that uh, we can only probe the uh, strong magnetic field better. And on the global scale, really, um, the driving force at this point is still the line of sight measurements, just because the transverse field is so noisy in a large portion of the solar disk. And I absolutely agree that we need to combine both these non-potential smaller scale and the global scale models to study you know, the connectivity between active regions. And I think those are crucial for some of these sympathetic events. Yeah, I think that's something that we'll be able to address with, somewhat with DKIST if we can observe outside, but we're going to still rely on other things to provide the larger context. There's a quick question from Nariaki Nita about um, whether things can be triggered by what's happening outside of the active region for understanding. So how do we understand the evolution of eruptions? Um, and the question about how well we can measure the vector field and outside um, of the regions. Whoops. Where it's, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the last part, I'm not an expert. Maybe uh, perhaps Rebecca could touch on that. But in absolutely, the uh, eruption in the weaker fields can you know, trigger the larger scale eruptions. Uh, for example, the, in the, the quiescent filaments, right? Um, those actually in, you know, contains a large amount of uh, uh, helicity, even though the magnetic field uh, is relatively weak. So yeah, I think that uh, really requires the efforts from both the uh, observation and modeling point of view. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're out of time and we need to move on, but thank you, that was a very nice talk again. And if you have questions you can, or comments, you can put them either in the chat or in the Slack channel. Um, I noticed that a couple people were having trouble following uh, slide changes. And the only suggestion we can offer is if